and welcome back to the Touchline Talk show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the content I put out every single week. It is time for some Premier League superlatives. Going to do my season preview a little bit different this year. Obviously, already did the storylines that I did last season, so be sure to check that video out as well if you haven't seen that one yet. Now it's time for my new addition to the season preview, which is the superlatives. Starting with favorite transfer window. I was going back and forth between two teams here. Ultimately, I settled on Aston Villa. I was also considering Manchester United because they solved a lot of problems. I'm just not quite confident enough in Rasmus Hoyland to give them this superlative, so I went with Villa. Not only did Aston Villa add Musa Diaby, Pau Torres, and Yuri Tillemans, attacker, midfielder, defender, they also did so without losing anybody of real importance to this team. And that, to me, is a big part of this. You have a team that performed so well under Unai Emery that were essentially a Champions League-level team once Emery got going. You get him a center back he's familiar with, who's played in European competitions, you know, deep runs with Villarreal and Pau Torres. Musa Diaby, Bundesliga experience, still, you know, young fits into kind of this team and this core that Aston Villa is building. And then Yuri Tillmans. I'm a huge Yuri Tillmans guy. I don't put much stock whatsoever in what happened last season. He just had no business being on a team that bad with a contract going down when he knew he was going to leave. You can say you would have liked to see a little bit more dedication from him. That's fine. I expect to see a different Yuri Tillmans this season with more talent around him, with a team that's competing in Europe that has legitimate aspirations, all of that kind of stuff. I was a huge fan of that signing and them being able to get him. I mean... For the longest time, it was kind of between Manchester United and Liverpool, it felt like. And here he is at Aston Villa. So, I, you needed to reinforce, and not necessarily reinforce, but just bolster that squad now that you're getting ready for Europe as well. And that is exactly what Aston Villa did. Second, most exciting new player. And this is a new player to the Premier League, so it doesn't count a, a James Madison going from Leicester to... Tottenham or something like that. My choice here, and unfortunately he is already injured and is going to miss an extended period of time, is Christopher Nkunku. Christopher Nkunku has been one of the best players in the Bundesliga over the past couple seasons. He was spectacular when he was healthy last season. If, if Nkunku can't score goals at Chelsea, I'm just not sure who can. He is at least a big part of what I see as the solution to the problems Chelsea have. Whether you play him as a striker, whether you play him wider, this team simply doesn't have players that are good at putting the ball in the back of the net. That is what Christopher Nkunku does. I am so excited to see him in this league, see him in this team. He is such an upgrade in the attack. And unfortunately, it's going to have to wait a little while to see what this actually looks like. I just, to me, he stands out above every other signing pretty much that's been made this summer in the Premier League. I, I feel that strongly about him and what he can mean for Chelsea. We're just going to have to wait a little bit to actually see all of that come to fruition. Manager under the most pressure. To me, there was only one answer, and it's Sean Dyche. And I'm going to revisit this point later. It's not about Sean Dyche. It is about the fact that no team is under more pressure than Everton as a club, as an entity. After being one goal away from getting relegated. 
And so all these fans want is to just get off to a pretty good start and feel like they don't have to spend another season biting their nails, hoping they don't get relegated and hanging on to every single moment of every single game, thinking it could be the one that decides whether they stay up or not. They just want a break from the stress. <laughs> and you look at some of the other teams that might be under pressure here. You know, I can't say Poch is under pressure after what his, the, the managers that preceded him were doing. And Foster Coglu, same idea there. You know, they're, they're not under pressure immediately. Can David Moyes really be under that much pressure if he just won a European trophy? That was another thought I had because Premier League-wise, it wasn't good enough last season. But it was sacrificed for what they ultimately achieved, which was a European Cup. You know, Steve Cooper at, at Nottingham Forest, he kept them up. I don't see a lot of pressure there. Just kind of going down the list... It, the other name I was thinking of is Roy Hodgkin and Crystal Palace. Just if things don't go well, you know, you you brought him back. What does this actually look like? Is it a return to the pre-Viera times when they just weren't very good to watch and kind of undoing the progress Viera made? They were still a mid-table team by the end of the season. The pressure cooker is Everton right now. And so for that reason, through no fault of his own, Sean Dice to me is the manager under the most pressure. Just because if it doesn't start well, the easiest solution is to fire him, whether it's right or not. And the fact that he got Burnley relegated, was a central figure in getting Burnley relegated doesn't help in this conversation, no matter how I feel about it personally, as I talked about when it happened. Sticking on that theme, team that will surprise. I'm going Everton. Now, do I think Everton's finishing in the top half of the Premier League? No. But look at the numbers and what they produced once Sean Dice got there. I believe it was just under a point per game, which, you know, isn't spectacular, but probably enough to avoid relegation. More importantly, though, the results against other teams at the bottom of the table is what saved Everton. The only games they lost were to the top half of the table. They did a great job of getting something every time they played another team near them in the bottom half of the table. That is how you avoid relegation. And Sean Dice did that. I am a firm believer in Dice. I've been talking about this and talking about this. He did something that it looked somewhat impossible, I would argue, in keeping Everton up. I think they're going to be one of the surprises of the season. They're going to finish 13th, 14th, be comfortable. It's not going to look spectacular, but if you give him a full you know, transfer window, a full preseason to get this team organized the way he wants. I just think he's going to get everything out of this team he possibly can. It's not a top half of the table team in any way, shape, or form. But at their best, they are more than a relegation candidate. And to me, that's what they're going to be this season. That comfortable mid-table, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there. The flip side to the team that will surprise, the team that will disappoint. I'm choosing Crystal Palace. Part of this is losing Wilfried Zaha without a, a real replacement. And just what he meant for that team, the way that he took all the pressure off of everybody else. He was carrying the attacking load. There's all of that. And then the other part of it is there's just not a lot going on in attack. You know, Patrick Vera got fired because his team couldn't score a goal. And it's not like there have been a bunch of attackers brought in to solve that problem.
And so if it gets bad again, I could see a world in which Crystal Palace are right there in the relegation battle. I would not be stunned at all if they get relegated. Now, Roy Hodgkin is very good at making sure those kind of things don't happen. So I wouldn't necessarily pick them to get relegated. But 16th, absolutely could see it. Of, you know, those mid-table teams outside of the top 10, I feel, you know, you got Brentford that you got to feel pretty good about. I'm going to talk about them in a minute here. You know, Forest, Bournemouth, potential relegation candidates. Everton, potential relegation candidate. There just isn't a lot in the middle once you get past West Ham. And even West Ham struggled last season. So the gap between, you know, 11, 12, 13, and 18 is just not very big. So it wouldn't be surprising at all to see somebody either go from comfortably mid-table to relegation or from relegation to comfortably mid-table, kind of like I'm suggesting Everton's going to do. You know, Wolves also, relegation candidate, but also finished fine in the ta- you know, table-wise. The margins were just really thin down there. And so the team I'm picking to kind of take that drop, finish 16th, 17th, is Crystal Palace. Especially if Michael Lise ends up leaving by the end of the transfer window. I, I'm just worried about a post Wilfried Zaha era and what that's going to look like and whether they can score the goals they need to. Breakout star. This is kind of a difficult one to choose. Ultimately, I went with Jao Pedro at Brighton and kind of went way out there in terms of a breakout star. Two main reasons for this. One, the breakout stars of last season were at Brighton. Alexis McAllister, Moises Castedo, Evan Ferguson. I almost picked Evan Ferguson. The reason I went with Jao Pedro and was thinking about Evan Ferguson is the second part of this, which is, obviously, Alexis McAllister no longer at the club. So somebody is going to have to pick up some of that slack. This team scores so many goals that you bring in somebody that uh, the Brighton invested a lot of money in, in Jao Pedro, with the the way that this system works and how finely tuned it is, why can't he come in and score 15 goals? Now, I don't know exactly how much he's going to play and, and what this is going to look like with the strikers. So it is kind of out there. I'm going for a... You're not really thinking about this guy and all of a sudden this guy is... You know, being talked about as one of the better players in the Premier League. Maybe it takes a little bit of time to get acclimated. But somebody's got to sort of make up for McAllister and kind of continue moving this thing forward. And they invested the money. So clearly they think Jao Pedro is that guy. Coming from Watford, so that is my breakout star. Next, team with the most to prove. Chelsea. Didn't have to think very hard about it. You're spending all of this money. You have this grand plan with all of these young players. You can't get them all on the field. Not many of them are playing very well. There is this looming question of what in the world even is the plan? Because none of this is making a lot of sense. Now, this window has made a lot more sense. This squad makes so much more sense now than it did, you know, the second half of last season. But this team needs to show up on the field and, at the very least, qualify for top four. Or, I guess, potentially top five. Make the Champions League. Because this is the epitome right now of spending a bunch of money, but not actually building a cohesive team. And it doesn't matter how much you spend if it doesn't work. If there's not a plan and a vision and a system. And they continue to not have a striker. And now the striker that they purchased is injured. And Christopher Nkunku. Getting Kai Havertz out was a good idea. You know, they were able to kind of clear their books with sending some guys to Saudi Arabia. 
this has to work at some point. And then you go and hire Frank Lampard, which everybody kind of re- decided for very good reason was a bad idea. Chelsea didn't really seem to care, and look what happened. Now you've got Pochettino in there. Can you, as I talked about before, just let him do his thing? Let him work with these young players, not make it about the the chaos at the club, the big picture, bully spending, all that. Can you just let him work with his players? Because if you do, I think this works. I expect a bounce back season from Chelsea. But nobody is under more scrutiny in terms of investment to results than Chelsea right now. It simply has to be better. Next, team with the most question marks. It was between two for me, Everton and Wolves. Ultimately, I chose Everton. Again, not Sean Dyche, but the club. This team can't score goals. And I do like Arnaud Donjuma coming in. I'm just not sure he's your savior. And I did say last season, I'm a Dwight McNeil guy. Is he going to carry an attack? No. But can he help you? Yes. Is he the kind of player Sean Dyche wants? Yeah. And look at what he did last season. On a team that couldn't do much of anything, he did something, at least. I think Don Juma can be that kind of player this season. But what they need more than anything else is they need Dominic Calvert-Lewin to stay healthy and start looking like himself again. Because... The, the numbers and, and the production from that center forward position between him and Neil Mopé last season were astonishing at how little they got out of those number nines. They lost with Charleston, never really replaced him. They're not, they don't have the money to go fix this problem until they cannot score goals. And so the questions are not necessarily, I mean, the the questions are there about the roster, obviously. But the questions are also just about the direction of the club. And are they just going to continue to let themselves be relegation candidates? What What is the reason to believe anything has changed? Because they let themselves get back in the same spot last season and it got even worse. And they barely survived. Now, to me, the answer to what's different is that Sean Dice is there. I will defend Sean Dice till the end. I just don't see what hole there is to pick in what he does other than it doesn't look great. Visually, aesthetically. He He's going to get the most out of this team. And it still might not be enough to avoid relegation. So Everton, team with the most question marks. Most unpredictable team. Hardest to kind of figure out what I expect from them this season. That would be Brentford. On one hand, don't doubt Thomas Frank. Don't doubt this team. Look at what they did last season. Look at what they've done since getting promoted. I mean, they've been spectacular. They are solidly mid-table. You're not thinking about relegation. You're thinking about, can we push for Europe? Great place to be if you're Brentford. There's also always the chance that it falls apart in one season. And you have Ivan Toney's suspension. Ivan Tony was one of the most productive players in the entire league last season. I believe only Holland and Kane scored more goals than him. That's the kind of player that can take a team like Brentford from 10th, 11th to 15th, 16th, and now all of a sudden you're getting worried about getting dragged into the relegation battle. I don't see that happening. There are too many teams that I can talk myself into getting relegated. The Crystal Palaces, the Wolves, the Evertons, the Bournemouths, the Nottingham Forest. To me, Bournemouth are still a tier above all. Brentford, sorry, are a tier above all of them. I just, I can talk myself into anywhere from 9th to 16th. And a lot of it has to do with what do you get outside of Ivan Tony? How important is Ivan Tony actually to this team? Is it a commentary on the system 
and how good of a job Thomas Frank has done that somebody else can come in and supply some of those goals while he's suspended? Or is Tom, Ivan Tony bigger than the system and really the secret to Brentford's success? We're going to find that out. Because there are just so many different ways this could go. In a perfect world, they're right there competing for a European spot. Also wouldn't be flabbergasted if they got relegated. Again, I don't think that's going to happen. There are a lot of teams that would need to pass them that I'm not convinced can do so, even with Ivan Tony suspended. But it's just really hard for me to, to pin down where they are in the hierarchy. Because I do think there are 10 teams ahead of them. And that's with Ivan Tony being available. Without him, it gets a little bit dicier. And then finally... Most intriguing team. Did not have to think hard about this at all. It is Liverpool. For all of the conversation about you know Manchester City's loaded bench, look at all these world-class attackers that come into the game. That City, and I'm a... This is going to go to Liverpool, I promise. That City bench right now, not all that terrifying. Then you look at Liverpool. The injuries prompted Liverpool to go by Cody Gakpo. So now you have Nunez, Salah, Gakpo. Then Jota and Diaz came back. That's five guys who should be starting in three spots. On top of that, you have now added Dominic Sobolzai and Alexis McAllister, who, yes, aren't kind of traditional... I mean, Sobolzai can play as a traditional winger. I'm assuming McAllister's going to play more midfield like he did at Brighton. But... You know, they're these guys who can fit into the 10, the 8, play on the wing. You can't start all these guys. To me, the team that has the loaded bench that's going to be able to change games with the substitutes in the attacking sense is Liverpool more than any other team in the league. I'm fascinated to see how Jurgen Klopp uses all these players. And then there's also the changing of the guard part of this. What does that rebuilt midfield look like? Is it, you know, Sobolzai and McAllister playing underneath three of those other attackers I just mentioned? Defensively, can they kind of hold it together? You know, Van Dyke's not the player he used to be. Trent Alexander-Arnold into the midfield. All of this stuff is going on. In addition to, no Champions League, but still European commitment. How does this team bounce back and handle the disappointment of last season? Are they title contenders? Because on paper, I think they are. But also, you've got some major questions in midfield. And yes, they tried to address them with some of the summer signings, specifically McAllister. But there are there's just a lot going on here. I can talk. I, I can see this team winning the league. I could also, if this doesn't work, see this team failing to qualify the Champions League again. I expect a much better season from Liverpool. I'm, I am fairly confident they're finishing top three. I also think they might be the team capable of giving the Manchester City the best challenge. Haven't entirely decided on that yet, but I expect big things from this Liverpool team. The injuries just kind of derailed last season again. The midfield wasn't. It, it was just. It took some transition and some movement to get this team back to where it needed to be but now i look at this squad and i say they are ready to go again and to you know push for 90 points challenge manchester city be back to what we expect Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool to be 